again by my guest Sayyid Ali Nawab. Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidna. Uh, before we begin, just give us a brief um, um, catch up of your experiences uh, in the holy city of Karbala, if you don't mind. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Once again, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh to our dear guests who have uh, once again joined us on Imam Hussein TV from the land of Karbala. Uh, the atmosphere in uh, the city of the city, the holy city of Karbala, is increasingly um, uh, is increasing day by day, if I can say so. Uh, by uh, uh, the early hours of the morning, if you leave your place of residence and start navigating through the streets of Karbala, starting from the uh, Al Qibla Street, Shar Al Qibla of Imam Hussein alayhi uh, salam, moving on towards Bain al Haramain and going to the shrine of Abu Fadl Abbas and Shar al Abbas, this, the Al Abbas Street, you will. Uh, be able to see the the more uh, mawakib, the more uh, uh, what they call takyat, where um, each mawakib, each uh, uh, group of people have uh, organized their own area and they've lit uh, with candles and with the uh, colorful lighting. And they spend the day in, in the mawakib from the early morning until the evening where they will each area starts uh, in their own procession and come to the shrine of uh, Abi Abdullah al Hussein to conclude their day. And during the day you see the, the processions of, uh, of, of Zanjir, you know, um, hitting uh, the back with the chains and lamentation, crying, majalis. So it's a one huge majlis. If I can say, Karbala turns into a one, one big major emergency. I, I think what's amazing is comparing, I think a lot of our viewers uh, have been granted the opportunity to visit Karbala during the 40th of Imam Hussein Arba'in. Uh, as we know, there are many narrations that, that, that uh, encourage us to come during Arba'in. But when I compare the taste of Arba'in to, to Muharram, the one thing that I feel uh, is the best way to describe it is that Arba'in is when the world comes to Karbala. But uh, Muharram is when Karbala itself is in mourning. So you see all the, the as you said, the Mokibs, which are the, the local um, groups of, of mourning processions um, from all over the city, designated by the areas of the city that they reside in, um, whether it be uh, by a certain shrine or um, uh, street Karbala was surrounded by walls with gates, so each gate has an has a, uh, and each Mokib is designated to that area yes. um, and you see throughout the day as you said they're coming in and, and, and pledging their allegiance to Imam Hussein and lamenting uh, Imam Hussein and it's something really it's got a very special taste to it it's something very beautiful about seeing the people who live in the holy city of Karbala who live and breathe the shrine of Imam Hussein and the shrine of Abbas um, making it ha having these 10 days as their opportunity to more obviously there uh, maybe I'm, maybe you correct me if I'm wrong what I understand is um, if you'd like to live in the holy city of Karbala it said that it is um, important for you to recommend if you to serve the visitors of Imam Hussein. Yes. So these are people who dedicate their life to serving the visitors of Imam Hussein. But during these 10 days, while they still do that, they also dedicate a lot of time to lamenting Imam Hussein himself and going inside the trench and doing those possessions, which I think is, is something very, very beautiful. In it. And you can see you know, so much history and, and, uh, and so many generations of love just in, in, in these groups that, that, that go inside. Of course, uh, in these shows, we are uh, going to be tackling uh, the story of Imam Hussein uh, in regards to his journey from Medina to Karbala and just trying to understand more about Imam Hussein Islam, and, and what we can take from his lessons uh, into our lives. Uh, and inshallah today we shall be uh, discussing um, uh, deviate and, and how far one, one, one can deviate. And subhanAllah when you think about someone like uh, Yazid or Omar al Sa'id or Shimur or people who fought against Imam Hussein, the first thing we often uh, jump to think is oh, how can anyone even dare to do that? How can someone dare to behead uh, Imam Hussein Aysa. How can that even happen? Um, and the first thing we say is, oh, if I was there, I would be the first person standing there to defend Imam Hussein Aysa. But when you read the story of Karbala, when you look at exactly what happened, um, the enemies uh, who are against Imam Hussein were telling him, listen, our hearts are with you, but our swords are against you. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they were, dare I say, the common Muslim at the time, the same way we are the common Muslims all the time, but they couldn't bring themselves to go the extra step uh, and serve Imam Hussein Aysa. And it shows you just how far someone can fall and just how scary it is to start getting into sin and start getting into injustice. You know, you slip up once, twice, three, four times and any of us can become, you know, 
uh, an enemy of Imam Hussein. And I think that's what's scary. And I'd like to quote uh, one of my favorite uh, poets is a, a Sunni Sufi brother. Uh, he talks about um, uh, the Prophet Muhammad's story, and we can use that parallel, parallel uh, for the Ahlul Bayt. He talks about the movie The Lion King. Say, I'm sure you've seen The Lion King, right? Mm -hmm. We've all seen The Lion King. Uh, and he says, The Lion King is about what? The Lion King is all about the Simba. It's about the story of Simba. So the movie studio, everyone who came together, the thousands of dollars, millions of dollars they poured into that movie were all there to facilitate the story of Simba. The characters, his father, uh, whoever else there are in the, in the film is there to facilitate the story of Simba. Um, and with the enemy of the film, Scar, is there to show us what a villain looks like. Mm -hmm. He said, in the same way, this whole universe Everything that is created is here to facilitate the story of the Prophet Muhammad and by extension we can say the Ahlul Bayt. Everything that is here in this world is here to facilitate the story of Imam Hussain uh, And we have to ask ourselves, who are we in this story? You know, are we the enemies or are we uh, the good guys? And SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has um, allowed for people like Yazid, people like Omar bin Sa'ad and Shimra to come about to show us what an enemy of Imam Hussain looks like. Mm. And again, show us how far someone can fall. Um, so tell us, how does well, how did people like uh, Yazid and, 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 and the enemies of Imam Hussein, how did they fall so far uh, to be uh, trying to, to kill the grandson of the Prophet just a mere 50 years after his death? I said, um, well, uh, if you allow me and give me permission, in one or two minutes, I quickly summarize just for the benefits of the, the brothers and sisters who are joining us these nights. Um, the first night we spoke about the importance of Ashura and uh, the position of the land of Karbala and what it means for the mourners of Abi, Abi, Abi Abdullah al Hussein to be in Karbala. The second night we spoke about the, the figure, this whole uh, emotional Who atmosphere is, okay. is rotating about. And tonight we want to know the enemies who stood against Abi Abdullah al Hussein and their characteristics and what caused their deviation. And what were the results? Inshallah, we will start with uh, a, a short verse of the Holy Quran and we will continue describing um, the causes of deviation and the results. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah, in, uh, Surah Al Isra, in chapter uh, Al Isra, verse number 60. There is a portion of this ayah where it says, وَالشَّجَرَةَ الْمَلْعُونَةَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ There is a tree which is cursed in the Holy Quran. If you go back to the tafasir, the books of the Mufassirin and the commentary, especially uh, Nur al-Thaqalain, for example, in, chap in um, uh, book number th uh, three, if I'm not mistaken, uh, page number 179, the author comes and explains this portion of this verse. وَالشَّجَرَةَ الْمَلْعُونَةَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ says Imam al-Baqir says this tree which has been cursed by Allah in the Holy Quran refers to the, the clan of Bani Umayyah the family tree of Bani Umayyah so when Imam al-Baqir comes and says that there is a family by the name of the Umayyads which have been cursed in the Holy Quran we have to go and investigate why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at times speak positively about an, uh, an individual or a family or a group and at times Allah curses a group of people and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no doubt has a reason behind everything and the reason for Allah to come and curse Bani Umayyah may Allah uh, bring down his punishment upon them is because of their um, deviation from the path of Islam and when we say Islam we say the religion that came as a result of the propagation of the Holy Prophet wasallam, The message of the Holy Prophet, these 23 years that Rasulullah spent pulling and dragging and, and accommodating all of those Arabs amongst uh, all of the problems and the, the wars and the battles that they had between themselves, the tribes and the clans. Rasulullah sacrificed everything so he he saves those Arabs and imagine during the 23 years what the Holy Prophet had to go through from um, people 
um, abusing the Holy Prophet, um, neglecting his rights, disrespecting him, his family, torturing him, depriving him of his privacy, depriving him of his of, of livelihood, uh, living in a comfortable place with his family, honor, dignity, respect. Um, here, some of those that participated in abusing the Holy Prophet was Abu Sufyan and his wife Hind. Abu Sufyan and Hind were the clan were from the clan of Bani Umayyah. Umayyah being the the great grandfather, and Abu Sufyan being the father of Muawiyah, and Muawiyah the father of Yazid. So it comes down in the lineage. The, the grandfather abused the Holy Prophet. The mother, the grandmother, ate the, the, the liver of Hamza in the battle of Uhud, seeking revenge for the death of her father and brother and, and family members. And that ran in the blood of Bani Umayyah. Those characteristics they took from Abu Sufyan and Hind. So the son and the grandson did the same thing with the grandchildren of the Holy Prophet after 50 or 60 years. Mm. We shouldn't be surprised when we come and read about individuals like Muawiyah and Yazid. And when we speak about these historical figures, unfortunately, this, this is a misconception that some of the followers of the other schools of thought, they, they, as soon as they hear the Shia mentioning the name of an uh, individual like Muawiyah or Yazid, they say these people, the Shia, those who love Ahlul Bayt, they say we love Ahlul Bayt, they are against the Sahaba, they are against the companions of the Holy Prophet. Whilst this is not the case, we highly respect the noble companions of the Holy Prophet. Whilst there were people who sacrificed their lives for the Islam and for the Holy Prophet and for the name of Allahu Akbar, mm. there were other companions who were busy diving and swimming against the tides, trying to accumulate wealth in the name of Islam, looking for power in the name of Islam. So, وَالشَّجَرَةَ الْمَلْعُونَةَ فِي Quran is the family of Bani Umayyah. So what are the, the characteristics of this family? When we search the books of history, we see like individuals like Abu Sufyan and Muawiyah, they did not enter Islam as everyone else did. Everyone else came, heard the, the message of the Holy Prophet, sat down next to the Holy Prophet. They received admonishment. They received advice. They received the beautiful sermons of the Holy Prophet. And they willingly, they willingly, out of their own choice, they made the decision to leave the worshipping of the idols or whatever they were worshipping and to join Islam. But this is not the case with the clan of Bani Umayyah. Bani Hashim and Bani Umayyah, they're cousins, they're relatives. Because if you go back and search in their ancestry, you will see that um, the great-great-grandfather was brothers with the great-grandfather of Bani Hashim, oh. Hashim himself. So Sakhr and Hashim, they were related. So hence there is this grudge from the side of Bani Umayyah against Ahlul Bayt alayhum as mm. Because Ahlul Bayt, they were always received, well received and well behaved and helped. And, and I think subhanAllah, uh, even today, like um, we have people that, that tell us, you know, why do you revere certain families over others? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself uh, has preferred uh, certain families of others in the Holy Quran. We see that all the prophets, many of them related by, by blood. You see Ibrahim and his sons, uh, Dawood, um, you know, even um, uh, Moses and Harun, uh, and so many other prophets are, 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 are related. And it shows us that there are certain families, certain lineages in Islam that are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and of course, when people see that, it brings about uh, jealousy in them because they can't understand or, or have the faith to, 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 to appreciate that some families will be more blessed than others. Brother Nuri, Ahsan, what you're saying is very beautiful and just reminded me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as human beings has given us the brains, the intellect. And we're not blindfolded. We are, our eyes are not closed. 
we can read, we can investigate. Allah has given us the brains. We can inv read the books of history and find that Allah has said, I've, I've given you the choice. I've given you the brains and you can decide for yourself. Who would you choose? Would you choose someone who gives you a rose or would you choose someone who wants to attack you with a knife? Mm. Of course you're going to go with the one that has noble akhlaq, noble morals, smiling in the face of others, calling people towards Islam with the, with the wise words, with a smile, with the good behavior. But this is not the case. I swear to you, we don't have any problem with those Sahaba on a personal level. Mm. We haven't seen them and they haven't seen us. Mm. They haven't done anything to us personally. Mm. But it's because we read the books of history. Mm. And we read, we investigate the books that have been accumulated and written by the other schools of thought. And they mention in their books mm. things about these characters that doesn't fit the aql. Mm. Goes against the Holy Quran. Exactly. Yeah. When we say aql, we mean the Holy Quran, the sayings of the Holy Prophet, and the, the, um, the wise uh, way of thinking of, of the normal people. Mm. So many Umayyah's characteristics carried infidelity. Kufr. There were individuals. Abu Sufyan he himself, on many occasions, when he used to sit down with his family members, he used to ask, and in the last stages of his life, he turned blind. He couldn't see. So he used to ask his family members, is there anyone sitting amongst us who is not from Bani Umayyah? And there were times where people were sitting, like the Holy Prophet, Amir al muminin other Bani Hashim. But Bani Umayyah couldn't come and, come and say, yes, there is. Or there isn't. So they used to stay quiet. And then Abu Sufyan used to make that statement. Talaqqafuha ya Bani Umayyah. Catch on. Hold on to it. Meaning the power. Mm. The leadership. Mm. Because leadership was in the uh, house of Bani Hashim. Talaqqafuha mm. talaqqaf al kurah. Take it as you take a ball. Fa'in ma ja'a bihi. What he says Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The message, the Islam, is not true. فَلَا جَنَّ وَلَا نَارِ فَالَّذِي يَحْلِفُ بِهِ أَبُوْ سُفْيَانِ The thing that I believe in and I swear to, which he means the idols, Hubal and Uzza and Lat. He says, فَلَا جَنَّ وَلَا نَارِ There was no message and there is no hereafter. Which means that I, Abu Sufyan, I don't believe in the message that Muhammad came with. I think, subhanAllah, just, just a quick uh, uh, side note in there. Two things that you can take from that is, number one, subhanAllah, someone even at the end of his age, you know, his days are coming to an end, there's nothing left for him in this world, can be so arrogant to continue holding on to that belief uh, of, of, of uh, you know, anti-monotheism. Number one. And number two, um, it reminds me of a quote that someone said about the, the, the Ba'athi regime uh, in, in, in today's context. They said, if someone rules over you of power 20, 30 years, and you take away his power, he will never be happy with sitting in a house. Yes. He will never be. He will support anyone that will help him get him back to power, even if it's ISIS or terrorism, or whatever. And you see that again with Abu Sufyan, who was in power, Absolutely. taken out of power by Rasulullah, and could not bear to think about the fact that his 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 lineage would not continue to be holding on to power. I'm Absolutely. sure Ma'awiyah kept thinking, you know what? Our grandfather was in power. We have to be in power too, because we can't Absolutely. live like normal people after Absolutely. having tasted power. So when we come to Abu Abdullah al Hussein, the grandson of the Holy Prophet. He comes and describes when uh, we mentioned last night that they um, said to Abi Abdullah, you have to pay allegiance. And Imam Hussein, after saying that in Ahlul Bayt al Nubu and what we discussed last night, he described himself and his lineage. He comes and describes Yazid and his characteristics. He says, Wa Yazid, Fasiq, he is uninhabitable, he's lewd, Fajr. Engaging in obscene activities. He is always drunk. Always has lost his mind. لَعِبُ الْقِرَدَةِ وَالْخَنَازِيرِ He um, wastes his time with playing with um, uh, animals. Instead of engaging in um, curing um, and uh, advising people and answering their questions. مُتَجَاهِرٌ بِالْفِسْقِ which was the most dangerous thing that a leader, a ruler, ruling people, especially the, the so-called Islamic Ummah, can um, openly be disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he still says, I am the leader of the Muslims. 
متجاهر بالفسق وقاتل النفس المحترم these are the characteristics of this person he was there wasn't any thing left for Yazid to do drunk all day bringing dancers musicians organizing parties inviting his friends over you know these things if you think about today there are some people in some corners of the world engaging in these kind of activities all of these things they push us towards deviation if we practice these kind of things these are the things these are the characteristics that are encouraged these are activities that are encouraged by the shaitan by the devil and not by the malaika they were all in the islamic leader of the ummah at the time Ahsan. Yeah. for someone to come and assume leadership and take pay, uh, and take allegiance from important characters 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 in islam like abi abdullah al hussein and uh, as books of history narrate uh, abdullah ibn zubair abdullah ibn umar who were uh, characters looked at in, in in mecca and medina for someone like that you can say okay what do you carry what are your experiences how do you behave for me as someone living in this time and age to come and follow you are you someone who is a professor are you someone who has invested his his time and his life to educating himself to researches so he can benefit the humanity you come i ask our viewers today sit down and, and read about the history of of yazid so you understand what obscene things he used to do and why that resulted in his deviation by causing the death of abi abdullah al hussein in the tragic way in the land of karbala mm. fisk fujur drunkenness wasting time with playing games with animals he used to he used to have a a, a monkey called uh, abu qais he used to sit him on a donkey and sit down and send that donkey racing around um, a place and that donkey once a, once upon a, t a time fell from the the back of the donkey i know this is funny but this is the reality I'm of the i'm funny because it's so pathetic I, I, exactly <laughs> this is so called the the imam the leader the representative of the holy prophet and who you, he, he you, himself he placed himself as you a, compare this with imam ali who was caliphs uh, two caliphs earlier who was going out in the middle of the night feeding four people making sure Carrying no one was bags poor, of food making sure no one was poor in his entire state exactly Apparently you compare the two and, and you know you ask why mom, so people ask why mom saying rose up against this person Ahsent, because he wanted to bring back the name of islam and wanted to give back people the way they wanted to live not the way that yazid wanted people to live ويزيد رجل فاسق شارب خمر قاتل النفس المحترمة معلل بالفسق ومثلي someone like me أبي عبد الله الحسين with my characteristics and with my lineage ومثلي لا يبايع مثله someone in my stature and my position which is the position of إمامة and leadership this responsibility which has been given to me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which no authority on the face of this earth is able to deprive me of this position I am not going to pay allegiance to someone like Yazid mm. who him he himself positioned himself there his father did, did the same and they forced people to believe in that way and anyone that disobeyed them and did not agree with the way they wanted to re rule people and anyone that they believed that was the lover of Ali ibn Abi Talib, they used to attack the house, demolish the house upon its people, behead the, the, the husband, and take the, the family as captives, and cut their financial means from Baytul Mal. Oh. Which, which leader does these kind of things? Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't be uh, surprised to read the history of Karbala. Mm and to read about the tragedy of Ashura and Abi Abdullah al Hussein, and, and question who would come and do this kind of things. Mm. Only a deviated person mm. would come and do this kind well, of things. SubhanAllah, um, it, it just boggles the mind. Uh, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to keep us uh, safe from, from deviating, because I feel like de deviation is, 
it happened so so quickly. There are plenty of stories about how uh, the most pious of, of, of people have fallen just by committing one sin, then a second sin, and then a third sin, then and then they keep going. I remember there, there was one uh, sto story which I'll just quickly, very quickly uh, mention. I think it was about a scholar, and I'm just paraphrasing the story. I don't remember the exact uh, details of it, but there was a very pious scholar who ended up, I think, killing someone or, or something, and he kept trying to cover up his tracks, and Shaitan kept coming to him and saying, "Listen, just do this, and you'll be fine." And it happened. It kept going on right until the end where uh, he was about to be hung and Shaitan said, okay, look, I'll save you if you prostrate me right now. And the scholar said, okay, I'll prostrate you. And then he was killed. And that shows you just, you know, he was one of the most pious scholars, but because of his, because of one sin, a second sin, a, th a, th a third sin, kept going down that road, he died uh, uh, in disbelief, subhanAllah. Um, Sayyidina, of course, you mentioned, of course, and as we know, uh, the Battle of Karbala is, is one of tragedy. Um, and, it, it, and we see how, how far, how, how far someone can, like Yazid can fall to be able to do such tragic things to, to, to anyone, let alone the, the, the household of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We have about 12 minutes left, um, so if you can please just take us on a journey uh, into the Masaib of Karbala. Inshallah. Just before I enter the, yeah. the realms of the Masaib and the tragedies of Karbala, just would like to end with a, a small um, uh, insightful story just to give something to our dear viewers to, co to go back and, and ponder and think about. Uh, in the Holy Quran, there are many stories. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these examples to show us that even if you live in the most um, ridiculous of times where everything around you pushes you towards sinning, there always is a time or there is an opportunity for you to repent. Mm -hmm. Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, she was living a life of luxury. There wasn't anything that she didn't ask for and they would bring it for her. She had power, she had beauty, she had wealth, she had maids and servants serving. She had everything, everything one can think. Then she had Fir'aun as her husband. Fir'aun, someone who used to say, Anna rabbukum ul -ala. I am your Lord, I am your creator. Whilst he was oppressing people, whilst he was depriving them of their rights, Asiya was observing all of this. But she wasn't saying anything. Whilst Prophet Musa alayhi salam was conveying the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she heard the call of Prophet Musa. And then she sat down and thought with herself, okay, I, the wife of Fir'aun, in the palace of Fir'aun, Fir'aun as a husband that says, Ana rabbukum ul -a with all the power and the wealth that I have, I am the first lady in the government. Now I am between two roads. Either I stay as I am and neglect the call of Musa alayhi salam, which is calling me to leave everything around me. And it's very difficult. If you're living in a high position, you've got wealth, you've got servants serving you, there isn't anything you need which isn't provided for you. And you make that split decision that you're going to leave everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of that nur, that light that you've been looking for. You take yourself out of darkness and you enter the light. So here, Asiya decides and that decision was costing her her freedom and her life. And eventually when she took that decision, Fir'aun started torturing her, torturing his own wife. You see how deviated one can be? The wife that the previous night you loved and you cherished and, and you um, took as a partner for you in your life, the next day, because she changes her ideology, you want to kill her. So here, he started torturing, he crucified her, and he ordered his ministers and his uh, army generals to torture her. And then, uh, that didn't result in her coming back to what she was on before. He ordered for a huge rock to be thrown on the body of Asi. And Asiya called Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, you see that I have left everything. Ibn li baytan andaka fil jannah. I don't want this pity world. <coughs> what I am looking for is the hereafter. Muawiyah and Umar ibn Sa'ad, they were looking for pity things in this world. Oh. Of course, they didn't believe that there is a hereafter. Oh. And Umar ibn Sa'ad says, if there is a hereafter and there is a judgment day, inshallah, I will go to Hajj and repent oh. within two years. Oh. This is a story that we can learn from, from the Holy Quran. 
And there is another story narrated by uh, Alam al-Naraqi in his book. Uh, he says that there was a, a, a lady in Basra called Sha'wana. Sha'wana was a dancer and had a beautiful voice. And she had a group of uh, women around her um, helping her to organize parties. And the wealthy people of Basra, um, those who were engaged in, in, in parties and dancing at that time, used to invite her. This Sha'wana, one day she was moving with her, with her maids and staff going to a, a, a function. During the way, she heard a house, uh, noises coming from a house, uh, people crying and lamenting and shouting. She sends one of her servants, one of the maids. She says, go and investigate. What is that sound? What is the cause of it? The first lady went, she never came back. Sha'wana sends another one until the third one goes and comes back. And she says, Sha'wana, this is a majlis, this is a, a religious function. There is a speaker speaking to people, admonishing them, advising them, asking them to repent, telling them that there is a hereafter. Make sure you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is going to judge you for everything. Sha'wana says, I wanted to investigate this myself. So Sha'wana goes in. She starts hearing that preacher advising people, reminding them of the qiyamah and the adab and jannah and nar. Sha'wana starts crying heavily. If someone wants to really repent and has the chance and takes that chance, Allah will guide them. The killers of Abi Abdullah al Hussein until the, until the last moments of their life, Abi Abdullah gave them the chance. Even Shimr, sitting on the chest of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, Imam told him, Do not, Imam was going to die because of the thirst, because of the, the, the wounds. Imam was going to die. And Imam told him, I am going to die. But I don't want you to be the cause of my death. And I will promise you that I will intercede for you on the day of judgment if you truly repent. But Shimmer did not. He had that chance. He didn't take it. Sha'wana did. Sha'wana started crying heavily. And she spoke to that preacher and said, Oh preacher, I am someone full of bad things. I've done many sins, many wrongdoings. The preacher said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you even if you was Sha'wana. And Sha'wana thought with herself, Woe be upon me that I have become an example to other people of how sinful a person can be, how deviated a person can be. And she repented and she um, became one of the best worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, deviation has devastating effects and the effect is that you will lose everything around you in this life and you will lose everything in the hereafter we'll say, then we have about five minutes left so if you can take us take our souls to to Karbala, uh, and take our souls to the story of Ashra inshallah uh, inshallah with some aside tonight is the third night and I will want to invite you to the land of Karbala where today the caravan of Abi Abdullah al Hussein after leaving the city of Medina and leaving behind the little Alila, the little uh, uh, ill daughter of Abi Abdullah al Hussein uh, behind who stayed with Umm al Banin. The caravan of Abi Abdullah al Hussein arrived after months of, of traveling between Medina and Mecca and, Mecca and, Mecca and Karbala uh, on the uh, second or third day of, of Muharram. They entered the uh, land of Karbala. Abi Abdullah al Hussein, upon reaching the outskirts of Karbala, he, his horse stopped moving, stopped traveling. Imam noticed that there is something about this land. Imam, of course, knew that this is the land of Karbala, but he wanted to inform, gradually inform his companions, his sister Zainab, his brother Abbas, his son Ali al Akbar, that we have reached our destination. Abi Abdullah al Hussein asks his companions, Ma is al Ard? My companions, what is the name of this land? They say, Sayyidi Aba Abdullah, Tusamma al Ghadriyat. 
Abi Abdullah Al Hussein asks once again, "Ma ismu hadhi al ard?" They say, "Aba Abdullah." They call this shot al furayat. Abi Abdullah calls again, "Ma ismu hadhi al ard?" It was then that one of his companions says, "Aba Abdullah, hadhi ardu Karbala." Abi Abdullah. Upon hearing the name of Karbala, said, "Inna lillah, wa inna ilayhi rajiun." Ha huna wallah, mahalu rihalina. By Allah, this is where we will base our camp. Ha huna tuqtalu rijaluna. This is where our men will be killed. Ha huna uqtalu ana atjanan gariba. This is the land that I will be killed in with a thirsty tongue all alone. La nasr wa la mu'in. Imam continues saying, Ha huna. تقتل أطفالنا in this land they will kill my children and this is the statement that broke the heart of Abu Fadl Al Abbas and Lady Zainab it is when Abi Abdullah says وها هنا تسبا نساؤنا sister Zainab we have reached the land that you will be taken as captive from Abi Abdullah says Akhi Abbas idhab ila ukhtina al-hawra Zainab because she has heard the name of Karbala Abi Al-Fadl comes to the camp of Lady Zainab he says Lady Zainab are you okay sister Lady Zainab says Akhi Abbas is this truly the land of Karbala. Why sister? Lady Zainab says because I have heard things about Karbala. Karbala لا زلت كربان وبلا ما لقي عندك آل المصطفى كم على تربك لما سرعوه من دم سال ومن دمع جرى أحسنت مسيدي الله مصلي على محمد وعلى محمد السلام عليك يا باب الله we send our peace and blessings upon you and indeed the day of Ashura is coming closer the day when our hearts will break and the day when our eyes shall weep upon our beloved Imam Hussein Islam and we pray that as the day of Ashura comes closer, we too can come closer to Imam Hussein Islam and as a result closer to his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah we can make these days, days of change in our lives as I mentioned earlier, we, are, we have, it takes 40 days to change a habit they say um, we, have, we had 40 days, we have 40 days from the first of Muharram until the day of Arba'in so perhaps we can pick something in our life that we need to work on, something that we need to improve on something that uh, a habit that we might have or, or a flaw that we might have, all of us have flaws, all of us have sins something that we can work on to really strengthen our soul uh, and inshallah I hope that um, my dear viewers alongside myself and our, my respected guests you too will pick something in your life that you can improve uh, and, 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 and do it uh, in honor and in the service of Imam Hussain Islam. Inshallah I'll be joined by Sayyid Ali Hakim uh, who will be reciting some eulogies after the break Inshallah we'll see you then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah.